And let's talk about what is called the second law of thermodynamics, but now we will refer to it in the context of continuum mechanics. So looking at the formable bodies. So we know then that the mechanical power entering the, bo the body is not a state function. The thermal power entering the body is not uh, a uh, uh, state function either. But the sum is in a state function, so an exact differential of something that we call the total energy, which we postulated, as I just said a moment, a moment ago, that is just decomposed into the kinetic energy and the rest, which is called the internal energy. So any variation of the total energy of the system is due to a variation of the kinetic energy, which we know perfectly what, it, what, what, is, it, what is, and the uh, internal energy. OK. So let's now consider, as a specific case, that we are dealing with an isolated system. You know, I told you already some days ago that there is no perfect isolated system because it's impossible to avoid any, any uh, crushing of the boundaries of the system of any type of energy or uh, heat or whatever. So there is no perfect, but the only perfect, I said, the only perfect isolated system is what? Which one? You remember? The universe. OK. So let's consider that we have an approximately isolated system, OK? So that this variation, the variation in the energy, is almost, uh, almost zero with a good approximation, OK? So in, for that system, the first principle of thermodynamics says that any variation of the internal energy plus any variation of the kinetic energy is equal to zero because it's, it, 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 it's equal to the total variation of the total energy, and this cannot change because the system is almost perfectly isolated. So for this system, then the first principle says that this term can increase, and if this term increases, that one decreases. So if we increase the internal energy, so we perform some uh, some uh, deformation power or energy power, or we increase the thermal quantities in the system, that means that we increase that, then, according to that, this term should be negative. So the kinetic energy should decrease. Or the other way, the other way around. So if we decrease the internal energy, the, internal, the kinetic energy should increase in this specific system in this isolated system. The point is, well, that's what the first principle says. But all these processes can take place. So processes increasing their kinetic energy, their, their internal energy, and decreasing the kinetic energy, or processes decreasing the internal energy and increasing the kinetic energy, are all them possible? The first principle doesn't say anything about that. It says just that if there is such a variation and it's positive, that is negative. Or if that is negative, that is positive. But it doesn't say anything about if the process that you are looking at, that you are considering, is possible, feasible, or not. And this very important issue is addressed by the second principle of thermodynamics. That's something that I respect very much. So I'm just enthusiastic about those guys, admire of those guys that work on that, because it's not intuitive. What we are talking about from now on is nothing that there are many aspects of it which are not intuitive. So it, it, it requests a lot of abstract thought if we uh, want to think about, about, about the, 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 this, this issue. Not thinking about something that it's fulfilled, but something about it's, if it's possible or it's not possible. 
So look, look, what we're going, we're going to discriminate if, if some physical, if some processes that we can imagine in our mind to happen, if they are really feasible in our universe. Maybe in other universe they are, but are they feasible in our, in our universe? And this is the answer that is, is intended to be provided by the second law of thermodynamics. Very abstract issue and very important too. Because as engineers, we should know what things that we do, or as engineers or scientists, whatever we do, we should, I mean, we should know, or we would uh, appreciate very much to know if something that we are dealing with is possible or not. If it's not possible, we don't have, we'll have to have any concern about that because this is not going to happen. But if it, it does, then we have to I mean, try to handle it and try to uh, manage it. So that is what the second principle deals about. Look, imagine that devised example, very specific, but imagine that you have this isolated system. So in that system, the total, that, that equation is fulfilled, the increase of internal energy should be compensated by the decrease of kinetic energy, or the other, the other way around. Imagine that you have a wheel inside which is turning with some velocity, so having some kinetic energy. And with no action from the exterior, at the same time, a brake just is applied. So it just, the, the action of this brake just uh, stops. I mean, stops the, 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 the wheel uh, turn. And what, how can be expressed in terms of the first principle of the thermodynamic? Well, as the brake is uh, action, then the kinetic energy decreases, isn't it? That's something that comes from our experience. So that term is smaller than zero. And then when a brake acts on something and producing friction, what is our experience about that? What happens? It heats up. So the point is that some amount of heat is produced. So that can be considered as a source of heat, and that, that heat can be moved through conduction through the interior of the wheel, or can be also be disseminated in the interior of the system by conduction, by convection, but there is some heat. And at the end of the day, this internal energy, recall that the expression of this internal energy includes some heat here, right? The capacity of heat in terms of sources or in terms of conduction to increase or decrease, right? So, so that example shows that that process in which we apply to a moving system some break inside an isolated system, decreasing the kinetic energy and con con consequently, according to the first principle of thermodynamics, increasing the internal energy is something that happens. This agrees with our experience, okay? But now, let's imagine the opposite process. So, that wheel stops, is stopped, because I have the brake on it. The brake is released, so the internal energy, the kinetic energy increases, the wheel starts turning spontaneously at the cost of decreasing the temperature or the heat inside the system. But now let's consider the opposite. What is our experience, our feeling about the opposite process? One process in which releasing the brake automatically, the uh, wheel starts uh, turning, so increasing the kinetic energy, and of course, the, the, at the cost of, according to the first principle, if that increases, that should decrease. So at the cost of the temperature, some heat being, I mean, uh, decreased in the system. Have you ever experienced such, ex such a process? Do you think it's possible? No. We have no, no, and, and our perception, our physical perception says that it's not possible. The process in which uh, spontaneously, at the cost of some decrease of temperature, something starts increasing the kinetic energy. That's not feasible. 
Does that contradict the first principle of, of thermodynamics? No. The first principle of thermodynamics would say that if the wheel would start turning, so increasing, being positive, the kinetic energy, then it would produce a decrease of internal energy. Okay? But it doesn't say anything about if this is or not pos possible or not. Okay? Other, other things. So th th this introduces the fact that there are processes, thermodynamic processes, that are not that don't occur, that don't occur in our in our universe, that are not feasible, that are not possible. If they are possible, the first principle of thermodynamic rules the balance of energies that are happening in that process, happening in that process. But they don't say anything. The first principle about if they are feasible or not. Another question: We know from experience that if we have something which is hot and something that is cold, and we put them into contact. Then heat goes from the hotter part to the colder part. Okay? So it's a process that can be reversed. Have you had experience? Or it, it, does it agree with your physical perception of physics of thermal bodies that instead of the heat, instead of going from this hotter to this cooler, goes from this cooler to this hotter, so cooling even more that and heating even more that. Without power. Without power, spontaneously. That is an isolated system. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So that agrees. These are two examples, but maybe we could find some others that tell us that not everything that we could imagine on the screen really happens in physical reality. So every process that we could imagine, saying, well, these internal variable, these variables, these thermodynamic variables move that way, the other move that way, okay, we can imagine that. But that those processes, not all of them, are feasible. And then that's again what is doing by the sec done by the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of, the therm of thermodynamics intends telling us what if that if that what of these two uh, processes that have, we have considered here, increasing kinematic, uh, kinetic energy or decreasing kinetic energy, if they are both possible, or only one of them is possible, the one which is plotted here is possible, but the opposite is not. So that is the, 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 the appeal of this, of this second principle of thermodynamics. It intends, it provides, in terms of formula of mathematical equations, answers about a very philosophical uh, question, which is, are processes, is this process feasible? So we can think then that we can have possible processes in the space, in the thermodynamic space. Imagine one processes, one process that goes from point A, so the value A of the thermodynamic variables, and then it varies according to a certain path, which defines the thermodynamic process to point B, to this final value of the thermodynamic variable. This process can be feasible or not. Imagine that it's feasible. The question is, is the opposite, so the one going from B to A, feasible? Maybe no, by the same path, by the way. Maybe not. And that's what happened here. Okay? So that process, that it's feasible in one sense, but cannot be reversed in the same path. So it's not possible going from B to A to, a to the same path. Maybe, maybe from another path, through another path, but not from the same path. Then it's called an irreversible process if that cannot happen, or if that can be reversed, then we call that reversible process. So we can think of the thermodynamic processes being, some of them, feasible and some of them unfeasible. And among the feasible, some of them can be reversed, and then we call them reversible processes, so it can be reversed through the same path, and some of them cannot be reversed to the same path. We can be go there through the same initial point, but through a second, a different path. They are called irreversible. Okay? So this, which is philosophy, is now stated 
through the second principle of thermodynamics, through postulates. Something that, I mean, we cannot prove. It, the postulates are as useful as they represent reality. So if we postulate something that when we check uh, if uh, in terms of reversible, irreversible, impossible, impossible processes, and these equations correspond to our perception of reality, we accept it as a postulate of the theory. I anticipate that this is rather philosophical, and we are introducing some variables that cannot be catched by our uh, senses. I anticipate the word entropy. Probably you have been told, you have heard in, in all your previous uh, courses, entropy. And you talk about this political system has a lot of entropy. Or the environment is losing, is, is, is increasing very much the entropy. Or the entropy of this, I mean, of this political party. I mean, the word is used, not, not appropriately many times. But what is entropy, in fact? Can we measure? Not exactly, if you can be. It can be understood as disorder in system of particles, in kinetic of particles. But not always. We see that here that our concept of entropy is not exactly that. Of course, with further elaboration, maybe we can just connect different concepts of entropy. But I want to, to that's why there are, so to speak, different expressions of entropy. Entropy is something that cannot be um, catched by our senses. We can talk about temperature, and all of you know what, is, what temperature is. Because we know if this is hotter than that, just by using our touch sense, our taking sense, and, and then, then there is something that comes to our nervous system, and then we get information of what is hotter, what is, is, is colder, and then from that we say that this has higher temperature than this. We have information about weight, for instance. If I take this, I just say that this is lighter or weighter than uh, heavier than, than, other, than other, uh, another object. We have information about velocity. We see something moving, and we see which one is two objects moving, and we say which one is faster than the other. Because our senses are able to capture that, that those variables, temperature, weight, uh, uh, velocity, etc. But entropy. I'm sorry, unless you are from another planet, another universe, you won't be able to catch what entropy is. It's just an abstract value. And second principle deals about entropy. 